Well, today we have one of those subjects which uh, people feel can be treated on two planes. One, the physical plane, and the other, the so-called spiritual plane. A lot of people with a scientific background consider any treatment of this subject at spiritual planes as all baloney and nothing worth consideration. They say, oh, I hope you're not going to talk all the meditation stuff and going and going out of time space that we have heard before. Tell us if there is some connection between this space that we know of, the physical space, and journeys beyond this space and time. I, of course, when I discuss this subject, don't take very long to tell them that can physical space also be without space and time? If you talk of journey in this physical space and time, are you really talking of a journey outside space and time? I am not suggesting that you leave this space and time and go into some other space and time. I am suggesting you start examining the space and time that you know, then move onwards. When people do that, they discover that there was in fact no difference between the approach to the subject. Whether you called it an examination of the physical space and time and the limitations of this physical space and time, or you started from the other end and talked of experiences in areas which cannot be called space and time. I would therefore conform to that tradition and start with the space and time as we know it. The space and time in which the space vehicles have been going out from this earth. I'll start from the space and time around us now. I have always believed that an impartial, unbiased investigation into truth must start from where you are, making the minimum assumptions. That if you make too many assumptions, you color your inference by those assumptions. I know a lot of people making hypotheses and propositions run into this difficulty. The audience can say, but isn't that an assumption that you are making? Isn't it all a suggestion that you're putting to yourself and to us? I know it's a valid question, it's a valid objection. If you are going to make assumptions and suggestions, well, they may be as good as anybody else's assumptions and suggestions. Where is the investigation of truth? So I suggest to you to please stand with me and stop me from making any suggestions or assumptions and stand with yourself and stop yourself from making any assumptions or suggestions. If I suggest something new to you, don't reject it because it is new. And if you hold on to something that is old, but is an assumption, don't hold on just because it is old. An assumption must be rejected as an assumption, whether it is new or old. Truth must be viewed as truth, whether it comes known to you or unknown to you. With this background, you must approach a difficult subject, like the subject of what would happen if in human awareness we could have experiences beyond time and space. This space has been investigated for a long time. We have roamed all over this space and seen the things that lie upon this space. We have seen things lying on earth. We have gone from place to place on this earth and given dimension to this space. We measured the distances between cities. We have measured the carpet area between one wall and another wall. We have measured the heights of places. We have measured how high the ceiling is. We have measured the three dimensions of this space over and over again. Nobody has been left in doubt about this. It is not an assumption we are making that we have measured the three dimensional space. We have done it. I have sometimes suggested that all things are assumptions except one. 
that one thing is that we are conscious. That is no assumption because we are conscious. In fact, the only direct, personal, reliable, certain experience a human being has at all times is that he is conscious. All other experiences can be clubbed as assumptions because they may not have been as they are. They may not have been what they looked like. They might have been illusions. Therefore, we need not go beyond the assumption that we are conscious and proceed cautiously to examine what we have been conscious about. We are conscious that we are measuring our length, breadth and height. We are conscious that every experience that we have had with sensory perceptions can be placed in space with these three ordinates, length, breadth and height. These three ordinates of space were known to us hundreds of years ago. But when we came to recent times, we found that these three ordinates do not explain what's going on in these three ordinates. We found that things do not seem to behave properly if they are placed in these three ordinates. They don't follow the rules of the ordinates. The ordinates rule says, Every ordinate must be a straight line. Height must be straight high. Length must be straight length. Breadth must be straight breadth. But we find that the objects we place in this space don't follow even this rule. That when we put too many objects in this space, they curve themselves. That was a very horrible thought. That we can't even make a straight line. In space, that even if we make a straight line, it gets curved because we put things into space? No, 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 no. The, the conditioned old assumptions would not accept it. A guy like Albert Einstein had to come and cry hoarse that this is true. You can measure the curvature. We place something physical in the so called straight space, it's curved. We didn't believe it. He tried to sell the idea as early as 1905. People didn't listen to him. In the 20s, he produced more documents to say, there is proof. They said, nothing, we don't want to listen to that. It was only towards the last part of his life in the 50s when he was dying that other scientists came up. In one of the conferences attended by 50 scientists investigating astronomy and other phenomena in space, Albert Einstein made the dramatic statement that there is no such thing as space, that space is created by the things we place into it, that if all things that are placed in space are withdrawn, there would be no space, that space expands depending upon what we put into it, and if we put matter into space, the space gets curved. And he said, matter is a form of energy. If you put energy into space, the space still gets curved. He said, I do not know, and I am not sure if in my own life I'll be able to establish, but it seems to me, I hope somebody will find out one day, that space as we know around us is so filled with matter, that it's got curved to an degree, it's curved upon itself. It has become enclosed, therefore it's become finite. A statement that 50 people heard, and all of them were silent. They said, we don't understand what you are saying. One man said, I have understood. He got up in the conference. Albert, I have understood you. I know what you mean by this. I know. And he sat down. He got up after a few minutes. He said, Albert, I understood then. I have forgotten now. <laughs> <laughs> I am telling you, today, of course, there is a group of more than 100 space scientists investigating the same phenomenon. There has been su sufficient evidence to show that the light of a star passing near the sun, which is the star nearest to our Earth, in space, deflects towards the sun. This observation has proved that the sun not only pulls other heavenly bodies or material bodies in space, but pulls even energy like light. The theory that has been propounded by Einstein and which has been now widely a 
accepted for further investigation departs from Newton's law. Newton said space is straight line. The apple from the tree fell upon this earth in a straight line because there was space between them and the earth had gravity which pulled it down. The apple was small, the earth was big, so the apple was pulled down by the earth. He gave the motivation for this movement of the apple from the tree to the earth to the earth. He said the earth pulled it down with its gravity. Einstein declared this was wrong. The earth had no power to pull anybody or pull anything. The earth had the property to get into space and curve it. And once the space was curved, when the apple came within the curvature, it had to take the path which looked straight and came to the earth. He shifted the initiative for the movement of the apple to the earth, the apple. That the earth created this curvature in space, the apple selected the curvature in space and came down to earth. He said, you may call it gravity if you like, I have no objection. That is gravity. But it is not gravity that pulls the apple. Gravity created the curvature. The curvature gave an opportunity to the apple to travel down to earth. Many scientists are still examining whether it makes any difference. But they find it makes tremendous difference. Because then all the bodies that are moving around in space are finding their own way. They are not being guided by other bodies. They are finding their own way and their way is through space which is curved and therefore nothing can travel in a straight line. The three dimensions were debunked after this theory. And then some kind of a new space concept had to be evolved to fit this in. So Einstein propounded that let us examine what happens to the apple and the ground while this apple is falling. He says the apple continues to have that dimension, so does the earth have the dimension, but when it moves down it takes time. Therefore the total thing to be measured is not the apple or the earth, or what they traveled, what requires to be measured, the entire event of the apple there and up to the earth. He said that there is no such thing as a substance place in a linear three-dimensional space. Whatever goes into space goes into a four-dimensional space-time continuum. And what is placed in a space-time continuum is not an object, it is an event. An event gets placed in a space-time continuum and that the ordinate of time is as important and of the same measurable quality as the three other ordinates. That they can all be twisted and turned depending upon what we place into the continuum. If we have a space-time continuum, depending upon how many events we pack into it, we change the structure of space itself. This is not a statement made by a yogi or a philosopher. Or a mystic. This is a statement made by one of the most distinguished scientists ever born upon this earth. He has said so. that the space time continuum takes shape from what is placed into it, and what is placed into it is called an event. That the events make the space time structure. Very dramatic thing. But he said something far more dramatic than this, far more significant than this. He said, but there is no way to measure the space-time continuum except relatively, relative to the observer who is measuring. There is no other way of measuring. There is no absolute time-space continuum. There is no absolute event. It's an event for an observer. And depending upon where the observer is, the measurement will be different. The same event viewed from one observer will have a different dimension from the same event viewed by another observer. He placed before us concepts which have since been proved. He said this clock which works here with its hands moving and we call it time. Which tick tock tick tock goes at a fixed pace. The mechanical clock with its mechanism is pushing.
pushing time at a certain rate which we read that's the time we know this time is not the same time for a guy who is moving in space at a velocity approximating the velocity of light when he found from doppler effects that the velocity of light does not change he came up with the startling proposition that if the velocity of light does not change time must be changing he said let's experiment and find out he said i am sure if there is a there there are two twin brothers and one stays on earth and the other goes out on a space journey and he travels very fast say at half the velocity of light and is going out in space they both carry very good swiss made watches with absolutely guaranteed movements with no mistakes and they both have the same watches while the guy sitting on earth will see that it's 8 o'clock it's become 9 o'clock it's become 10 o'clock the guy is gone up will still find it's 5 minutes after 8 and they are both moving at the same rate he predicted that a man moving at a high speed approximating the velocity of light could come back after a 10 minutes journey and find that is twin brother died 10 years ago this is a scientific prediction not a yogic theory it's under investigation in your country here in the united states by scientists whose programs come on the television whose names appear in the register of scientists not philosophers they are investigating this phenomenon this is being shown in your planetarium in boston your country the effect of velocity of movement upon time the proposition is time changes not the velocity of light time itself changes not not subjectively actually now experiments have been conducted unfortunately after the death of albert einstein with atomic clocks atomic clocks where the guarantee is that they cannot go wrong more than one second in 1 million years those clocks have been used in experiments because they cannot take them too fast and they cannot take them too far away so they said let the accuracy of the clock be so good that even if there is small fluctuation we should be able to see they left one atomic clock on the earth took another on an aircraft fast moving aircraft out in space both were set identical so that they should have the same time correct up to 1 second in 1 million years and when they made the space journey the scientists checked the accuracy of the clocks on the earth and scientists in the aircraft checked the accuracy of the clock in in the air there was no change they were both working correctly when the clock came back it showed different time this has been done here in your country thus the scientists of today feel happy we have been able to prove what einstein was trying to tell us but they have opened up completely new doors of perception by proving this we have been so used to taking time as a fixed thing the time itself can undergo a change depending on your speed entirely new proposition now we go back to astronomy and we find what startling results have come from thinking about what we were viewing in the sky in the space we used to say there's a star twinkling in the sky twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are today we wonder even more than we did at that time because the star that twinkles there may not be there now at all it has taken several years light years for the light to come to us there is no star near nearer than one light year away the nearest star besides our sun which we can see was there a year ago we have found very beautiful good telescopes alomar and other places all over the world we are dotting ourselves with laboratories with better and better telescopes to go further out into space and with those beautiful equipment and instruments we peer out into the sky and we say there we have reached the fringe of space because that star is 1 million light years away we forget what does 1 million light years away mean it means what we are seeing was there 1 million years ago 
If it is there or now or not, we don't know. There is no way of knowing. Because the fastest way of viewing anything as an observer is at the velocity of light. There is no means known of going beyond the velocity of light. Albert Einstein proved that the only absolute thing in this world is the velocity of light. Everything else is relative to it. Therefore, when we go into the fringes of space, suddenly dawned upon us, we are not going on the fringes of space. We are going on the fringes of time. That's funny. That if we try and look out in space, we can't see space as it is now. We can only see space as it was. There is no way of seeing space as it is now. There is just no way, absolutely no way, of looking at space as it is now. That the deeper we go into space, the more we go into history. It's a funny situation. That means we can never see the sky at one time. Never. As an observer, we have lost the capacity of even seeing space, except as time. And is time the creator of space? It seems to be there's no difference. If we can't even see space except as time, then what is space? Albert Einstein had just started experiments on the nature of the observer when he unfortunately passed away. I propose to go along with a group of scientists sometime and work further on the theory of the observer. But today I'll give you hints on what it will mean to be the observer of space and time. Because Einstein said it's the observer's position that determines the nature of time and space. To come back to the great big telescopes which are looking at the fringes of space, billions of light years ago, that means billions of years ago, we say that is the edge of space. You might as well say that's the beginning of the universe. Is there any difference? If you say we are seeing something that happened a billion years ago, is it not the same thing as saying we saw what the beginning of the universe? Are we seeing the edge of the universe or the beginning in time of the universe? There is no difference in the two. Amazing scientific discovery. But a bigger discovery has come, which has baffled us. An Indian scientist was involved in that, and a British scientist, Narlikar of India and Hoyle of England conducted experiments together on quasars seen at the edge of the space, the very edge of space. And they were moving across. The shift, the red shift in the spectrum can be so accurately used now to determine the distance. We have no doubt how far they are. But the way they moved this way in the sky showed they could not move that way. Because nothing can move faster than the velocity of light. And the angle they were making was faster than the velocity of light. Now what do we do? Here is something which we can see. And we have always believed, even Einstein said so, that nothing will move faster than the velocity of light. And there is no way to explain this phenomena except by granting that at least these bodies are moving faster than the velocity of light. So we have come up with Probable theories, which are still under examination. The probable theory is that this is outer space, beyond this space, beyond this time. And these are things moving faster than the velocity of light. That we are trying to increase space because of a big bang that set us in motion in the first place. And we will never reach the velocity of light, but approximate it. They are things which are slowing down from a higher velocity. They will never slow down to anywhere below the velocity of light. That there are two creations. Therefore, even in the so-called physical space, we are encountering a strange position. That there may be two completely closed circuit spaces. As it's difficult for intellect to even imagine this thing. A closed circuit space. It has been closed because of the curvature created by matter. Energy's conversion into matter or energy plus matter has created so much curvature it's become enclosed like a balloon. And another one which is still independent, maybe it's not yet enclosed, it's open. What are, what are we talking about? 
a closed space and an open space. When this baffling, mind-boggling experience was going on for scientists, another even more mind-baffling, boggling experience took place. And that was they found that indeed all matter was energy. Not that energy was being made into matter, that energy looked like matter. That was a very strange thing. They found that matter consists of molecules, all matter. That molecules consist of atoms. That atoms consist of electrons and protons, or a combination of the two called neutrons. That electron was nothing but an electric charge of energy held separately. That if electric charge or energy begins to rotate around each other, it becomes matter. That the difference between energy and matter is so simple that if energy moves around itself with an opposite charge, it becomes matter. But all matter is nothing but energy moving in these circles. And that what gives bulk to matter is not the energy, but the space between the energy. Beautiful discovery. That the space between the proton or the neutron and the electron, that space makes what we are seeing. The whole matter, all these big objects in space are created by the simple device of energy going into orbit. Negative energy going into orbit around the positive. And the negative and positive broke up from a common charge which had no charge, from nothingness. The Buddhist said long ago that everything came out of nothingness. The scientists say no. Out of nothingness, by a breakup, negative and positive came up. They made matter. That doesn't sound very different. But once the electrons start moving outside, the protons or the neutrons, neutrons are nothing more but proton electron. Again, electrons having fallen upon neutron or proton. Proton is a positive charge. And has a heavier bulk in matter. Electron is a negative charge. If the electron falls upon the proton, it becomes a neutron. So there may be a molecule or an atom in which there are more electrons because there are more protons in the nucleus, or there may be less electrons and uh, more neutrons. They may have the same weight because only the electrons have fallen into the center, into the nucleus. Those are called isotopes. I am not going into the chemistry and physics of matter, but want to draw your attention to the space between these two. And they said, what will happen if the electrons start dropping into the, into the neutrons or protons, to the nucleus? They start shrinking. A thought was expressed when I used to study physics for my graduate work way back in Pakistan. In those days, the analysis was all the space is taken out of matter. No other change is made. Only the space between electrons and the nucleus is pulled out. They are allowed to rest upon each other. This earth will become like a football. And everything will be intact as it is. Only it will be the size of a football. Now, scientists say that is wrong. How can it be a football? It will be the size of a marble. Now they have found out it will be the size of a marble. But the weight, the structure, everything will be the same as of this earth. If this collapsing process starts, that the electrons which are spreading it out, spreading out energy to giving it such beautiful color, shape, experience, beauty, which we are seeing around us, if these negative electrical charges start collapsing upon the positive, we will be reduced to a marble. The whole earth. Now they say maybe the whole galaxy can be reduced to a marble. And they say not only reduced, it has been reduced in many places. Because we did not understand. We were getting the effect of deviation of light, which Einstein predicted and has now been observed, not only near our sun, it's taking place in places where there is no sun. And it's taking place as if there was a sun. Now we know it must be a little marble up. But with the density, weight, oh, not the volume, 
everything else except the volume, the mass of a sun. We can't see it, but it is the power of the sun. And since it is in a state of collapse, it's so heavy, it creates great curvature in space, therefore has tremendous gravity. Anything passing near that gets deflected. If a plane were to fly near one of these, just absorb and become a dot, finish. We call them black holes in space. A black hole is nothing but collapsed matter, where the electrons have fallen upon the nucleus. And they are so heavy, with so much mass and no volume, that they can pull anything into it and devour it. Now there are so many of these bodies which we see in space, which are spread out, like this earth and the planets and the sun and the stars and the moons. And there are so many such things which are collapsed, both having the same property to curve space. This has been a great eye-opener to scientists. This has led to a lot of speculation. What is the nature of all this space? This space is creating life. We thought we were placed in space. The space existed first and then we were placed in it. This shows no. It is space that creates things. It's the other way around. And space is no different from time. What a thing that they have come to. Something that the Indian philosophers were saying 4,000 years ago. Now scientists are saying now. I am only bringing you up to date through what Western scientists have said. I am not saying anything yet about what we have said earlier. This is what Western scientists have said till today. What is going on in space is that we are having space create things and become itself. Out of nothingness, space creates things and becomes space. Very funny. Out of nothing, nothingness, everything comes. And it can collapse back into nothingness. And this process is going on all the time. Hoyle and Nurlikar, in their joint investigations, proved that this is observable in nature. That all the time from nothingness which is coming and from manifest form of energy matter complex, it is going back into nothingness. They have said the real secret must be nothingness for which it comes beyond human intellect to understand. But the Buddha said, all life, everything is created out of shunna, nothingness, and eventually ends into nothingness. The Buddha spoke of it 2000 years ago. The Rig Veda, the oldest book available on earth, which has been quoted in the texts of 5000 and 7000 years ago. 7000 years ago, the parchments and the monuments which have left messages referred to that book. We don't know how old it is. The four Vedas, the oldest books in Sanskrit, say out of nothingness alone everything comes and dissolves back into nothingness. And this cycle goes on continuously. Not much difference in the conclusions. I am just bringing you up to date that there is not much difference whether you investigate space time scientifically, so called scientifically, or to other processes. But one word about the observer, In, at some future time when I come again to your country, I will be speaking extensively on the contribution that the observer makes to this creation. Because I will prove that the observer was the entire creation. But that is the nothingness point. It evolves as an observer. Suffice to say that the nothingness exists for the observer, that creation exists for the observer. It disappears for the observer. You take the observer away, everything disappears, including nothingness. That unless an observer is there, even nothingness is not there. Who observes nothingness? Unless consciousness is there, you can be conscious of nothing, not even nothingness. The consciousness must be persisting, even nothingness. Must be beyond nothingness. Therefore, if future scientific investigation has to be done in the nature of the observer, in the true nature of time and space, it must be done through consciousness, which persists even beyond nothingness and is responsible for any observation you can make of anything. 
all the observations I speak of have been made because there was an observer who was conscious. An unconscious observer can also make no observation. A conscious observer is responsible for all that we know about time and space. Why not start from there? More of it later on, scientifically speaking. I want to now draw your attention to our subjective view of time and space so that we don't hold on to too many old assumptions. It is our assumption today that time is a unidirectional single space typewriter going on, tuck, 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 moving in one direction. Uni single space, it must move at the same fixed time, indicated by the watches and clocks. And in one direction, for future it comes, holds to the present for what we are doing, goes back into the past. I want to show you the fallacy of this assumption, first of all. It's a completely fallacious assumption, but we are all holding on to it. By habit, by lack of the power of introspection, lack of power of looking at ourselves, lack of the habit of looking at ourselves. I don't have power. We have the power. All of us have the power to look at ourselves. Okay, let's examine. What is time as we know it? The time as we human beings know is past, present and future. Supposing this experience of past, present and future is removed from human consciousness or human experience, we lose whatever we know about time. In the wakeful state in which we are conversing with each other now, time means nothing but the experience of past, present and future. Now let's examine these three segments. Present. Does present have time? No. Before you say present, it is future. The moment you say it's past, it doesn't hold. It doesn't hold even for an instant. An instant is time. Astrophysics uses nanoseconds as a unit, which is a billionth part of a second. But the present is not even a billionth part of a nanosecond. Can't be. Before that's the future, then it's the past. Where do you hold it? What is the duration of present? There is no duration whatsoever in time for the present. Present is timeless. Let's be clear about that. And all the time we were wrong in making an assumption, we are doing things in time in the present. We can't do it. Because there's no time. Where are we doing it? In the future or in the past? That is left. Why are we talking so loosely? Well, I'm talking to you in the present. What I mean is, I'm talking to you in the immediate past. I have spoken the words, they have just gone to the past and I call it present, loosely talking. It's not strictly correct. If I am technically correct, then I cannot talk to you in the present because there is no time to talk. Even a single word takes time. A single syllable takes time. Single motion takes time. Single sound coming out of me takes time. I cannot do it in the present. Nor can I do it in the future. It hasn't come yet. I can only do it in the past. It is already in the past, but so recent past looks like the present. Illusion. Assumption. It's an assumption we make that we are doing things in the present. Indeed, we are doing in the past. Okay, then let's take it that there are only two things. Future, slipping timelessly, slipping without any time hold into the past. Then we might as well examine the future. What is the future? Supposing human awareness lost the capacity to hope, to fear, and to anticipate, there would be no future. Future, the word future would be written off from our dictionaries. It's the capacity of human awareness to anticipate, to hope, to fear, that creates future. If we did not do these things, there is no future. No future as we know. No future as that comes to our awareness. But that is not the interesting part. The interesting part is that all hoping, fearing and anticipating is done again in the past. It takes time. You cannot hope except in time. That's in the past. You cannot anticipate except in the past. You cannot fear except in the past. It takes time. Even to fear a thing takes time. Even to hope for a thing takes time. Even to anticipate something is happening takes time. It cannot be in the present. 
then all this so-called future is also past. The only thing that exists is past. There's no such thing in time, which we can call present or future. It doesn't exist in time. The only thing that exists in time is past. Now we come to that beautiful conclusion logically following from this. But if there is no present and future, there's only past, how do we experience it? So nothing can be experienced in the past except through memory. Human awareness is experiencing the past only through memory, whether it is one second ago or one year ago. Whether it's happened just a millionth part of a second ago or has happened ten years ago. There's no way of getting it into awareness except through memory. Recall. Doesn't it look funny that our entire experience, which we were confusing by assumptions as present and future, turned out to be a memory of something that has already happened? Because memory cannot be of something that is happening. Memory means it has already happened. You're recalling it. Where and when did it happen? If everything is past, we are just recalling it in memory. Where are we recalling from? Where did it happen actually? It must have happened somewhere. 